I, I'm going to call to order the Thursday, January 11th, 2018 meeting of the Northampton Planning Board. Uh, the item for 7 p.m., uh, 40R Smart Growth Permit for a 15,400 square foot three-story mixed-use building by the Community Builders at 35 Village Hill Road, Northampton Map ID 38A-109. Oh, if we can just put a hold on that just for a second. It may take me a minute to plug it in anyway. Well, then it's perfect. So, <laughs> um, is there anyone that has public comment on any item that is not on the agenda? <coughs> required to offer this opportunity. <coughs> Uh, if there's anything that's not on the agenda that you would like to offer comment on, now is the time to do that. Going once, going twice, seeing none. Thank you. <laughs> uh, then we will go as soon as you're ready to the presentation for the first item. Great. Uh, John, if I could just, oh, yes. just a, a quick disclaimer. Um, because of the nature of my work, I have uh, purchased property from uh, Mass Development uh, at the Village Hill uh, previously and I have worked with community builders and Jeff as well in the past I don't think any of those things prevent me from being objective if anybody thinks differently you can raise your hand and I can recuse myself okay next question is anybody know how to get rid of this little bar at the bottom here <laughs> I don't see anything <laughs> <laughs> oh. there he goes Jeff Squire with the Berkshire Design Group uh, here on behalf of the community builders. Um, we've, got, um, we've got a host of folks here who I'll get up and say a few words in a moment. Um, just real briefly, I'll let them make some introductions also. Um, but this, um, this project um, piggybacks the second hearing that you'll also um, listen to. So this is for two projects up at Village Hill. Um, and so, um, you know, I'll, I'll get into more of the details later, but um, I'd like to introduce um, Rajna Crowley from Community Builders, just to talk a little bit about Community Builders. Um. Good evening, Rajna Crowley, Community Builders, um, sometimes known as TCB, and we have a 50-year history based out of Boston, developing affordable and mixed-income housing, both their owners and managers. Um, our mission is to build and sustain communities where people of all incomes can achieve their full potential. And um, just at Village Hill, you know, we were together with Mass Development, um, early partners in um, kind of bringing the whole concept to life um, in the late 90s and, and early 2000s. We were the first ones to develop on the site, specifically Hilltop and, and Hillside, two different rental um, properties, one rehab, one new construction, a total of eight buildings and 73 units, um, and then an off-site component associated with the Village Hill redevelopment up at Ice Pond Drive, a 26-slot subdivision where we um, worked with Valley CDC also um, to sell six affordable homes um, and the lots at market, market lots. So um, at Village Hill, we're really proud of our history here, um, setting a tone for really high quality, mixed income, and, and very energy efficient housing. We're very excited to come back again. It'd be you know, sort of the first or the last of the development um, at the overall master site. And specific to today's um, hearing, uh, we're very excited about North Commons, which is our larger building, 53 units. Um, and 35 Village Hill Road, which is a smaller 12-unit building um, near the front of the site. Both um, will have a, a mix of incomes, both low-income housing tax credit as well as a workforce tier. Um, so we're introducing a more market rate component um, uh, to the site, which we think is very much you know, needed there. Um, we're excited about open space and recreational parts of this project and we're also on the energy efficiency front, very excited to be designing our larger building to um, passive house standards, which is, we can get into the details of that more, but um, wanted to say hi and, and thank you. Um, and then Laura, I don't know whether you wanna get up and make some comments on behalf of Valley CDC. Um, Hi everybody, um, Valley CDC, we're uh, pleased to be partnering with uh, the community builders on this project. Um, our role in the project is as a co-sponsor and as kind of a community liaison. Uh, Valley is based here in Northampton, we've been here for almost 30 years. 
Um, and so most of the affordable housing that Valley CDC has developed is here in Northampton. So, um, <laughs> as I said, this is pause just for a second, sure. so I can ask a clarification question. Um, there's already been a couple references to the second item, but I just want to clarify: we need to treat each of these items separately. Right, and you're going, you'll so we're, this, separate this hearing is about this item. Right. The other hearing will be about that. Item. Okay, yeah. I've got this set up so that we okay. hopefully accomplish that. <laughs> but there is some overlap, obviously. Sure. Um, so again, I've. Um, Berkshire Design and, and me personally, I've been involved in some of the redevelopment ep efforts up here for the last 13, 14 years. Um, so again, I'm, I'm um, pleased to be part of the team that's sort of bringing this all to fruition and, and finishing out the sort of the full build out. Um, and you know, coincidentally, we're also working with a, with a co-housing group trying to um, revive that project. So um, you know, truly bringing this this master plan to fruition is. is um, you know, been very exciting to me, and, and as, as a firm Berkshire has been very proud to have been part of this. So, um, so this lot 20 um, also referred to as 35 Village Hill Road. So there's some overlap between the two. I hope it doesn't get too confusing. Um, that's the actual address. Lot 20 is the designation that was given to it um, during the original subdivision. It's a small, um, isolated lot that has remained um, sort of in the core of um, you know Village Hill. Um, it's a small 0.4 acre uh, parcel that's surrounded by the other two um, community builder buildings. So, um, so this this larger building here, as well as this one, are both um, under management of community builders. So they had a real interest in this site. Um, there's very little there now. It's mostly grass. There's a few clusters of um, trees that have been preserved. These are all new street trees and plantings along this edge. Um, again, I will try to move through these fairly quickly, hitting on the highlights, and feel free to stop me if um, you have any questions. Um, again, just the sequence of the, the existing site, um, it's really quite open right now. Um, it gently slopes from the north mm. to the south. What we're proposing um, is a three-story uh, mixed-use building. Um, there's 15,400 gross square feet on three floors. Um, there's a footprint of about 5,400 square feet. About 2,600 of that, 2,500 of that is commercial space on the south side. You can see sort of the delineation in this plan. Um, you know, this, this line here really separates the commercial component. Um, TCB's main offices are, are proposed for the center. Um, and some leasable, um, you know, hopefully restaurant or cafe space in the very end. Um, residential units on the first floor at the northern side and then res residential units on the, on the upper floors. Um, again, it, it is a tight site um, and, you know, the, the, the vision for the site has always been something very similar to what, you know, what you're looking at, a, a building that matched the massing of a lot of the surrounding buildings and really helped to frame Village Hill Road as a main street. Um, we are utility-wise, it's, it's a very simple site in terms of connections just by virtue of, you know, what was anticipated um, in the master plan. Water and sewer both come off of um, stub that are left in Olander Road or Olander Drive. Electric will bring around to the rear of, it, rear of the building. Um, drainage, this site was originally um, was conceived of as not generating any storm water um, in the original calculations. What we've done is provided a rain garden on the north side of the building um, near the residential entrance to the, to the building um, as a way to just slow down to detain any roof water that we can. Um, it's by no means a requirement. The calculations for the larger stormwater system had accommodated you know, almost a full impervious site. So we're, what we're doing is providing you know, some additional infiltration and storage capacity in that stormwater system. Um, and with the idea that um, you know, what we're looking to do is, um, I'm just going to back up and look at the rendering, is really create sort of a garden and, and sort of a, a more residential entrance to that side of the building. The commercial side is really on the south. Um, there's much more of a residential feel, you know, in the north, and that's, that's the residential entrance. So trying to distinguish between the two was one of the goals. Um, so some, some amenities like a bike rack, um, some benches, um, you know, some boulders, some a more diverse planting as part of that rain garden. Um, was, was really the goal. Um, photometrics, again, the, t the site um, is, is pretty tight. There's very little, um, uh, there's no need for 
um, site lights, tall site lights, parking lot lights. We're sharing parking with um, the, the parking that's already there now. Um, that was laid out and envisioned as accommodating, um, as, as to accommodate the build out for this, for this lot. So the numbers for that included this build out. Um, so we're not building any new parking aside from um, introducing a new handicap space along Village Hill Road. Currently there's no handicapped accessible spaces along Village Hill Road. So we're, we're introducing one at the southern end just as a way to um, you know, have a, a, an accessible means of um, access to both the, um, the TCB offices but also the, the commercial space at the, on the south. Um, back to the photometrics, most of the lighting um, is going to be um, uh, ceiling mounted lighting underneath the um, canopy on the north side. There's a couple of lights there. Um, the other lights are under this covered areaway, um, porch area on the south side. Again, there's, they're, they're roof mounted lights that, that shine down. Um, I think we are somewhere around 0.2 foot candles at the property line. Um, understanding the city's bylaws, it's a little bit challenging with this given how close we are to the street and the sidewalk and the zero lot line requirement. Also, the street lights provide you know, a, a, an ample amount of light there, so we don't need to overly light this. Um, and then there is an emergency egress light, uh, down light, similar to what's pictured here on the back side of the building. <coughs> uh, but there's really very, very little need for, for an abundance of lighting. Um, and Cliff, do you want to yep. get up and talk a little bit about the architecture? And Yep, I can be pretty brief. I'm Cliff Bomer from Davis Square Architects in Somerville. And uh, I'll just highlight a couple of things. As Jeff already mentioned, the ground floor of this building has three independent uses. There's a, a, centr a central commercial space that will be TCB's offices, about 1,300 square feet. On the south end of the building, there will be another commercial space. A tenant is uh, not known at this point. On the north side of the building, it's the residential entry. There are two, uh, two apartments on the ground level and then five units on each of the two floors up above. Uh, the language of the building is uh, pretty traditional. We, we looked a lot, of, uh, a lot of the existing buildings on the site, including some of the historic buildings and some of the newer ones. Uh, the materials are both uh, masonry for the base and for that southwest corner of the building that's really the most prominent view of the building when you enter the site and then uh, clapboard materials on the upper upper levels um, there you get an idea <coughs> again, that the, the commercial space that isn't designated yet it's commercial space with the entry on the south side so we have an entry on the south side an entry on the west side for tcb and an entry on the north side for the residences and then a uh, secondary egress for the upper floors on the west side of the entry. Uh, again, the materials are pretty traditional, masonry, uh, tr uh, lots of trim. We haven't uh, done our signage package fully yet, uh, but at this point, uh, I think you get, you get the picture. It's pretty simple, simple building, simple architecture. But in a, a, a very prominent view, it is really the second building you see when you come into the site. So we wanted to highlight that southwest corner of the building. Thank you. Um, I think before I leave, um, what at least I have to say at this point, the one other thing I will mention is uh, just tree replacement and, and some of the tree standards. Um, <coughs> there's a small cluster of existing trees sort of in this bump out right here. There is one tree that we do need to remove that's on our site. Most of the rest of it is, is, is on the, um, the other TCB site or within the city right away. Um, so there is a 26 inch caliper tree I think we're removing. We've put in here as much as we can possibly hold. There is another five inches of caliper replacement that we were short on this site. So we are proposing that on the north portion of the site. I can get into that in more detail, but um, just because we're, we're so limited in terms of where we can plant you know, significant trees on this site, we, we felt it was more appropriate to plant them um, where there was more open space. So, um, with that, it's all yours. Okay. <laughs> I'll entertain questions from the board before we open for public comment. Uh, I, I have a question. I may have misunderstood <coughs> you, but I, but I thought I heard you say that 
you didn't need to provide for water runoff because it, was in, it wasn't impervious? When, when the stormwater calculations and overall master plan were designed, which included this site, there was a much higher impervious cover percentage on this site, and it wasn't anticipated that any of that would be put <clears throat> into to a detention system because of the size of the site, that it was piped directly into the, there's a stormwater line that runs east-west right across, you can see the easement line, but essentially runs to the, the large detention basin on the east side of the site. Um, the calculations for this specific site were originally intended just directly tie into that drain line and not be attenuated or dealt with on site at all. We, we'd have to treat it, but it was all it was all water that was being directly fed via a pipe system into that stormwater system. So what we've done is at least introduced a rain garden. All it is is roof water, but we're, we're diverting all the roof water into the rain garden first to at least give it an opportunity to infiltrate, slow down you know, the conveyance of stormwater to that same system, but it eventually the overflow will get there. So there's a strong likelihood that in smaller events, you know, there will be no stormwater discharge from this site. It'll all be detained, you know, within the rain garden. Well, as you said, it's a very tight site, and yep. your building occupies almost the entire lot. Right. So how could you contain the water from the roof on site? That's what we're doing with the, with the rain garden that we're showing. We've got a small amount of space at the very north end of the, at right. the site right adjacent the drain line runs right through you can see the you know it basically connects these dots there's a 24 inch or 36 inch you know main drain line that runs all the way to the detention basin when this was originally conceived of the calculate the stormwater calculations showed all of the runoff from this site being piped directly into that drain mm -hmm. line with no rain guard no detention on site because there wasn't the space for it. It was expected that it was going to be a tight site and there wasn't room for it. So, you know, by those calculations, this site specifically wasn't required to, you know, the language is to the maximum extent practicable is, is the way it's written. So that was the original master plan? The original master plan. And so through this, we've at least provided some ability to d detain that and slow it down, even though it's not required. There are some questions um, from staff that even though the rain garden isn't required, you show it, but you don't show the plantings and so forth that go with it. And there's specifically. a there's a planting plan. Um, I don't have the detailed one here. There is a planting plan that calls out a number of species in here. There's a sort of a generalized, you know, wet basin mix for for the bulk of it. Um, I think <coughs> they had a couple of comments. One was about the the planting media specifically. Um, I know there's some notes in our detail. Again, we didn't develop a full set of specs <coughs> for this yet. More typical details, and so I wasn't sure how does that work, if, uh, Carolyn, if it's not specifically required, but they're giving it to us. So DPW had a similar um, um, comment, and they want to see um, one of their overarching con um, uh, requests from you all is that you prove. Um, I include a condition that says that final construction drawings be submitted to them for review, and it should include a detail of exactly the plantings and the media and all of that that are going in um, for that rain garden so that they can evaluate it and make sure it meets their standards. So yes, we would we um, need to see those details. Did, uh, sorry, did uh, DPW have any other comments? Um, yes, uh, mostly about details um, on the <coughs> waterline connections. They want to see, so in revised plans, um, clarification of drain pipe elevation and sizing for stormwater as well as water. Um, and um, they, before a building permit, would also want to see the operation and inspection agreement um, recorded. Um, at the Registry of Deeds, which is standard um, condition. And then um, uh, relative to the tree protection, the established trees that are especially on the sidewalk that were planted with the um, construction of Village Hill Road, that all the tree protection uh, require, um, specifications be installed and inspected by the city prior to construction. <coughs> 
and that protection be done in, in accordance with the ANSI 300 standards, part five. Um, let me just see. I think um, that was the only other condition or issue from DPW. Oh. One last thing, just playing devil's advocate. The, the site is tight, and so you don't have enough space for trees, so you have five inch caliper left over, proposing them for the north site. For the sake of argument, if this project moves forward, and for whatever reason the north site does not, then how, how, how do we make a condition to relocate those trees, which could be, did, if the north lot doesn't go through and it's redeveloped in a different manner, and the trees that we said to put up there get removed because of it, or you know what I mean? How does that work? You could put a condition that says prior to CO that they need to show that they have met the tree replacement requirement. And if at the time, if the projects are out of sync for whatever reason, they could um, come back to the board and say, we'll put X amount of dollars, or maybe at that point you'll know that the project is, it has a start date and so it's all ready to go. So I think giving a condition that's based on the certificate of occupancy will leave enough time to um, sort all of that out. And, and they, they would have the option to make a payment in lieu of planting anyway. Okay. So um, as long as they're meeting that criteria in 12.3, um, by the time of CO, I think that should probably cover it. I guess I'm saying if, if by the time it's CO for this project, they plant half a dozen trees on the north lot, and then so they meet the requirements for this project, then the second project doesn't go through and it's redeveloped in a different manner and those trees need to be removed or whatever. I'm just trying to avoid that right. odd scenario. I guess I would say that um, by that time, by the time they get the CO, I think you'll probably have a very clear path about whether that north property is going to okay. be developed. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so if, just hypothetically, if, if they weren't putting the rain garden <coughs> in, mm -hmm. So it could just go right out to the to the main. Right, because it was already a it was already accommodated in the original calculations for that detention pond. So, so what's the DPW's um, rationale for requiring this? It seems like a, sort of a no. Yeah. no they, they're, they're not requiring it. They are offering it up, and so I think DPW is saying, well, if you're going to offer up it up just give us more details well but also even more than that the original plans um, and approvals at the state hospital indicated that wherever possible even if you're showing you're meeting the standards we want you to use um, um, infiltration or green infrastructure to the extent practical practicable um, and so it's still there. I mean, there wasn't a define. There wasn't a specific regulation that they needed to meet, but there's an overarching goal because this is, you know, a redevelopment of state hospital. We wanted to um, build it differently and to best practices. So um, we want to see as much of that as possible, as opposed to shooting water off to the detention pond. And they've shown it on the plan, so now they need to make good on it. <laughs> But every it's little bit helps before. to to yeah. infiltrate on site. Oh no, no yeah. argument there. Yeah. It just it has the it has the n no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, but I think also from DPW, I, I imagine they're saying, you know, you can do nothing, or but if you're going to do something, then you, you have to use the it. standard. Do you it know, right. It, yeah, it's either you can't, yeah. you know, yeah. To, and I'm sure that is a protection against someone saying, well, I'm going to come in and you know do this even though I don't have to do a lousy job and actually make it worse instead of better or something like that. So yeah. I, I mean, I'm assuming that's where it's yeah. right. coming from. But it's, yeah, it's a valid point of your reward for doing something good is to have to do yeah. some extra things. But it's not really extra. I mean, they're, they've said they're going to do it. They just right. haven't put uh, yeah. the details to the page. Yeah. Other questions from the board before I open it for public comment? Is there anyone from the public that would like to comment on this project? Uh, okay, we'll start with Jen, work down that row, and then go back on this side, go behind. Okay. Thank you. Hi, planning board. Um, 
Um, Jennifer Derringer, 60 North Street, Northampton. I'm here to wholeheartedly support this project. I'm the managing attorney of the Northampton Office of Community Legal Aid. Uh, at Community Legal Aid, we represent low-income folks in a variety of civil, uh, civil legal matters. And every day, I see how critical the availability of affordable housing is to, to the core stability for low-income families. Every week, I go to housing court, and I see families and elders evicted from their private housing in Northampton because their tenancies are simply not sustainable. Families are facing rents that are sometimes as high as 80% of their income. Simply put, this country needs more affordable housing. This is particularly true in Northampton, where rents are high and low-income folks are competing with young professionals for rentals. From a broader perspective, we live in an area with incredible income disparity, and our affordable housing tends to get built in lower opportunity, poorer communities, both to our south and north. Uh, kudos to Valley CDC and TCB for bringing more opportunity to low-income folks both by providing affordable housing and offering them the opportunity to live in Northampton, which is comparatively a very high opportunity community. And by high, high opportunity community, I mean are generally is defined as communities with relatively high incomes, low levels of poverty, and high quality schools. This project is especially wonderful in that it's, some of its units will be set aside for folks with mental health issues, which is a population that struggles particularly hard with poverty and hence the need for affordable housing. Thank you. Uh, next in that row, yes. Peter Blanchett. I live at 41 Valley Street in Northampton. Um, I just want to uh, voice my strong support for this collaboration. Uh, and I'd just like to say that uh, uh, I grew up in a situation deeply affected by the problem that this addresses. Um, I moved, my family moved uh, 11 times before I was 15 years old, and every single one of those times was because uh, we were always renters and we always had to move uh, because uh, for some reason our, ten I never heard it put that way, but it's a great way to put it, uh, our tenancy was unsustainable. Uh, and that could have been because uh, sometimes it was because we had a great landlord mm. who decided to uh, sell the house and sometimes we had not such a great landlord who uh, decided they wanted uh, their mother-in-law to move in or something like that and this was you know a long time ago but I think there are a lot of people in Northampton uh, now just like my uh, family who need this kind of housing and they need the stability of it. Uh, my father had a full-time job. Uh, my mother was a domestic servant, full-time job. My father had two full-time jobs. He worked 80 hours a week. And, um, and, and us not having stability of housing meant things like I can remember, remember my father using his vacations to pack us up so we could move to another place from his two full-time jobs. So there are a lot of people out there under that kind of stress and changing schools often. And uh, uh, it's incredibly hard on kids and families. It's incredibly hard. And uh, I'm really happy to see the work that CDC is doing. And I think it's gonna really help this city become a place where uh, some people can stay a little longer and uh, work here and contribute and uh, raise a family here. So for that stability, I really, that alone is enough for me to really wholeheartedly support it. Thanks. Thank you. We are go going on this side, and then we're going to move to that side, <laughs> Madam Mayor. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Madeline Blanchett. I live at 41 Valley Street, and I'm here because I'm a board member of Valley CDC. Um, and I just wanted to say that I became a, a board member of Valley CDC because Valley was um, uh, looking to develop the lumberyard, and I am not quite in a butter, but I am a neighbor to that um, project. And um, I just started going to public meetings, and I was so impressed with the commitment of um, the staff of Valley CDC. I was so uh, impressed with the architect, who's actually the architect on this um, project, also in terms of the receptiveness to um, people's questions, people's uh, feedback. 
And um, in that process uh, for the lumber yard, I did a little research and, I, and, and, and just looking at the, this project um, for Village Hill, seeing the AM <coughs> income, it, it's even actually a little higher here than what, what's envisioned for um, the lumber yard project. But I do remember seeing that um, Northampton police officers would be squarely uh, income eligible for this type of affordable housing. New school teachers in the Northampton schools would be uh, squarely um, eligible. And, you know, and of course, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, the downtown service workers, of course, artists, where, you know, we're a city that um, talks a lot about um, the value of the arts. And so, um, and just in terms of I, 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 a healthy community, a community where people who work here, who contribute so much that they don't have to come in here and take a bus up from Holyoke, they can live here, they can go to our schools. It, it's, it's so important to the whole community. Also, I, um, as a resident of Ward 3, I'm aware that um, the Bridge Street School has had a history of having under enrollment, of struggling with low numbers, and Village Hill would feeds into um, that school system. So uh, I just want to really support the project, and uh, just as both a board member and a resident, um, just having so much confidence in the groups who are developing it. Thank you. Thank you. Beth Grams Hexby. I live at 74 Village Hill Road, in, I'm, I'm a resident of Village Hill. And I have a letter here that I can leave with you if you take letters, um, but I'm reading, um, it's undersigned by a number of Village Hill residents, so I'm reading for them. Um, I say, we the undersigned residents of the Village Hill neighborhood are writing in support of the community builders plan development at Village Hill. Village Hill is a planned community designed to provide a variety of housing options that incorporate sustainable, energy efficient design and are available for folks with a wide range of incomes. The community builders, known as TCB, were the first builders of new residences and remodelers of existing buildings at Village Hill. They set a standard for green building and aesthetic design for affordable housing, which was then continued in construction that followed for market rate residences. They have been receptive, very receptive, as um, you were saying, to um, community input in their pre-design stages, their design stages, and <coughs> the post-design um, stages of construction. They have listened to concerns and responded with changes to their plans and or inclusivity of community ideas and wishes into their plans. Initial concerns focused on creating building plans that preserved as much green space as possible, which they have done so, and I guess I'm referring to both projects. I, I, sorry, I, I, is that okay? I won't have to read it twice, or, or you won't have to listen to it twice, but that's referring definitely to the second project. Um, they have uh, um, organized meetings for the whole community with small groups, with individual community members in the evening and on weekends, and that's just so far in the process. Um, and they have attended monthly Village Hill Resident Association meetings, have always responded promptly and thoughtfully to community requests or overtures. Um, as we certainly note that they are a development corporation of high quality who depend for their work funding from other resources. Um, it is a testament to both the overall design and the maintenance and care given to the TC properties already in place at Village Hill that many homeowners in the neighborhood have been and are <laughs> unaware that these apartments are actually affordable housing properties. As a whole, our community has applauded the, the efforts of TCB in bringing this new development to Village Hill. We welcome them as an already established good neighbor who have shown great effort in considering the community and their plans and show continued interest in being a strong presence in our community. Thank you. Should I just How many people signed it? Um, it was signed in November. I didn't reissue it this time. Um, and I think we have <coughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100
and I'm currently the Executive Director of Community Action, we're the anti-poverty agency for the region. And I'm here to speak in a couple capacities. One, as an employer, we have over 300 people working for us up and down the valley, including a significant number of people living in Hampshire County. Number two, as an, a concerned resident about the um, income disparities that are e even still growing in Northampton, and how can we create housing for people who ha have were born here, raised here, or moved here to find a better life. And then third, as a person who's been intimately involved with the redevelopment of the state hospital since uh, I think my f the first meeting I went to was in 1987, called by Valley CDC. So uh, I'm here in those, wearing those couple different hats. So starting with um, the affordable housing, pro I wanna speak to both by the way. Um, I, I'm in a strong supporter of this project. And I think that that lot really needed to be built out and it was time to have that done and the building looks great. And uh, the commercial side of this project is, is, is important, so I'm very supportive of this. So secondly, the housing side, the mix of affordability in those particular units is really important. If you think about what that means, it means people that are making $15 an hour can afford to live in Northampton. People who are living on SSI after working for much of their life could live in Northampton. That's what that means, those income levels. And I want to echo what Mr. Blanchett said. It means that families can move here and raise their children here and their children have a better shot in life because they've spent their entire life in one school district, which when you look at what's so devastating to low and moderate, especially low income children, it's mobility. It's mobility almost over anything else. Um, secondly, as an employer, we have struggled to keep people working for us because of the same problem. They can't find housing that they can afford, so they move. They move up and down the valley. They move from Orange to where? To Springfield, to Northampton period, for a minute and a half, and then they move to Amherst, and then they move back up. We, are, we have employees driving from Orange to here to work because that's where they can find housing. So I don't think we want to be the kind of community that has to bring people in from elsewhere to do the jobs that we don't want to get paid that kind of money. I think we want to have a community that meets the needs of people at all different income levels. And then finally, I want to make a point here that TCB, when they first applied for this master builder designation at the, at the state hospital, right from their response, they said they wanted to provide needed mixed income housing on a site which minimizes impact. I think we can give them a check on that. And safeguard <coughs> valuable community open space. And I think anybody who goes through that development today can say that both of those needs were met started with a lower number of affordable units on the, on the um, site, and then we, the city went up because, in order to get the amount of money necessary to demolish the buildings that were on the site. It, it was a four plus million, Carolyn may remember, needed to uh, demolish the, those buildings. The city um, was straight out of the gate in terms of passing zoning that met all the requirements that the state needed to give us money back. Uh, to offset the cost that it increased density brought to the city. It's been a model, really. This development really is a model for a lot of other developments that are happening now across the state. We, we were out of the box first, and I think the city did it right. So I urge you to support both of these projects. And I didn't write you a letter to say that, but <laughs> I'm sure it's recorded somewhere. And, uh, and I thank you for your service. This has got to be one of the hardest boards to be on in city government, except maybe school committee. Thank you. Other comments? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'll just stand here. Uh, I'm sorry, you have to. No, I have to go <laughs> oh, okay. I'm Linda Baker. I live at 53 Fork Crossing in Village Hill. And I'll be brief. I think I was one of the signers of that letter that yes. Beth has. If I wasn't, I would have. Um, and I moved to Village Hill because I wanted so much to live in a place where there was mixed income housing. So I'm very much in support of this project. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or conversation, discussion from the board? There's more. Just a quick comment. Uh, Jeff mentioned again that it's a tight site and uh, the photometrics, there's a tiny bit of spillover. Um, into uh, across the property line and didn't know how that could or should be addressed or well, I, I noticed there was this pr uh, recommended condition 
Is that what that's trying to address? Uh, no, it's no. just color uh, uh, temperature rendering 3000 K. So, and I think that's what's spec, but there are a couple different um, lights on there. This is really just on the side. I think he said the sidewalk side, and there's right. probably mixing too with street lights. So it's probably hard to, to. The board has the ability to allow that based on what was submitted, but no greater than that. If it's uh, you know, so I think um, the other piece. I mean, it's a very small amount of spillover. I agree, and I'm not. I'm, do we have to condition that? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm we thinking. State it. You need to state that you're approving the light levels as, as presented so that it's clear that you're approving that additional spillover on the sidewalk. And it's on the main street, you know, going in. So I don't, I, I think that's. Um, I, I'm not so much thinking about it, truthfully, in respect to this project as future projects so people don't come back and say, well, you gave TCB a pass. Why, why don't we get one? Other questions, comments from the board? <coughs> Move to close public comment. Second. Second by Jess. All in favor? All opposed? No. Okay. Any other conversation or discussion? I think it's a great project. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it has impact when you run the turn the corner. That's, it's one of the first projects you see, the first building in Wilson. Um, so I, I like everything about it, the, the layout, the, the purpose, the uh, functionality, everything about it. So no issues on my end. Um, there's just one other comment I wanted to uh, um, tell you about from Department of Public Works that I didn't mention the first time when you asked, Mark, and that is just a minor detail about the brick sidewalk that comes into the, um, the paved walk that comes into the concrete, cement concrete public sidewalk. Um, their comment was to reduce the radius of that, that wide um, entry area and that also it needs to be cement concrete in the right of way. Then back behind the right of way it can be brick. But the city doesn't, state standards don't allow anything but um, cement concrete. <coughs> but that also can be included in the plan yeah, yeah. amendments yeah, okay. that have to be reviewed. Okay, anyone, I've got, I think, eight things, but if anyone would like to make a motion, we can check each other. Tess? <laughs> <laughs> motion to approve. <laughs> motion to approve. Um, I don't have my, thank you. Let's see. Motion to approve 40 hour smart growth permit for community builders at 35 Village Hill Road, map ID 38A-109 with the following eight conditions. Uh, prior to site work, the applicant must have all tree protection measures installed and inspected by the city and in accordance with ANSI 3000 standards. Uh, number two, all lights must be 3000K or warmer temperature. Uh, number three, detailed planning plans must be submitted for DPW review. Number four, uh, O&M plan for stormwater um, system must be recorded at the registry. Number five, prior to issuing certificate of occupancy, must meet all tree replacement requirements. Number six, must provide DPW with detailed clarification regarding drain pipes, um, water, and stormwater connections. Uh, number seven, approval of the plan includes the light levels as presented in the drawings. And number eight, all uh, sidewalks that are in the public way, is that right? Must be concrete, may not be brick. Oh, the five-inch caliper of additional trees is what is th is the tree replacement that must be that must be shown prior to issuance of a CO. That's it. Second by Dan. Thanks. All in favor? All opposed? <coughs> Halfway home. <laughs> now to the main event. <laughs> right, the main event. <laughs> And um, to, wait, to wit, I want to ask just one question. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this is, a, I mean, we, we have to. Right. Okay. I just want to stay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just want to, oh, wait, people are leaving. But. Okay. Um, just want to clarify two things. One is 
this was for 7.30, it's only 7.45, we're doing really good, so. <laughs> That's great. Everybody's still happy. Um, second one is that we will, be, we will need to continue this particular item, so we will not reach a conclusion in this particular hearing. This hearing will have to be continued, just so everyone knows that if you're waiting for a final conclusion tonight, that will not, that's not possible to happen. So everybody knows that this is the beginning of the conversation that will continue in a couple weeks. Okay, great. So with that, um, uh, wait, I have to call. Uh, I right, now call open the he public hearing for 40 r smart growth permit for a 60,000 square foot, 53 unit, three story residential building by the community builders at Olander Drive, Northampton, map ID 31C-17. Thank you. Um, so again, I won't get into a lot of the preliminary details, um, but just again, um, familiarize you with the site that we're talking about. Um, so what this site in its raw form consists of is roughly 41 acres. It's everything on the, on the north campus, um, north of Port Crossing. This is where Picoy's um, residential development is being, um, is under construction currently. Um, Ford Crossing and Old Lander intersection here, um, but this space right now is is was largely the home of Old Main. Um, that's where most of the original State Hospital uh, footprint existed. Um, but it is is been an, an open field um, since then, um, and the the tree line continues to slowly encroach on that site. But that's really what we are interested in. Um, and, you know, just sort of on a personal note, um, you know, many of you were here with the last projects for transformations. And so it's been interesting for me as a landscape architect and as a design firm to go through that project and then have this project follow on its tails, which is really a completely different project. And it's been refreshing to be, be part of this. Not that the other one wasn't um, equally rewarding, but it's been nice to preserve as much open space as we have in this, in this scheme and, and what we've been able to do. So with that, um, so again, just the, sort of the existing um, condition survey overlaid on an aerial showing the extent of um, some of the trees and the forest, those shaded trees that you see, um, they'll show up in a number of plans, but these are all part of the, um, the 35 quote unquote specimen trees up at Village Hill. There's a number of other trees that fall under the tree replacement bylaw, but just so everybody is aware that there's sort of two tiers of specimen trees and they're sort of used interchangeably. So that's, um, so again, a, a little bit, bit more um, detail on the site. One of the other interesting things to note that comes out of this, uh, comes into the site plan is right now there's, there are two um, large piles of, of material that are left. Um, there were debris and, and spoils that were left over from other projects, construction projects. Right now they're, uh, just covered with grass um, and, and maintained like the rest of the site. Um, one of them will go away, but we're taking the one on the western side and reshaping it and utilizing that as part of our uh, integrating that into the site plan. So I'll explain that a little bit more, but um, I just wanted to highlight that. So again, mostly open field. Um, there's a tree line um, that you can see in this image. Um, beyond which the slope begins to, um, you know, go downhill. It slopes off to the west, um, to the Picoy, and then off to conservation land. The north side of the site starts to drop gradually down to um, the existing trail system and then steeply toward the Mill River. Similarly, the east side slopes down to um, where the old recreation building and some of the other um, old hospital amenities, used to, uh, outbuildings used to be. Um, but there's probably a 25 foot grade difference between the east um, and the center of the site. Um, and so what we're looking at um, versus um, the south is, is one large uh, building on this site. This is, um, the footprint of this building is roughly 19,000 square feet. Um, it's about 57,700 gross square feet in the entire building. It's three floors. Um, and again, this is, this is strictly residential uh, apartments. Um, Cliff will get into some more of the detail about the um, distribution of units and bedrooms um, and other facets of the building. But in terms of location on the site, what we've tried to do is tuck it far to the north of the site as we can while providing enough space um, on the north side for parking um, and to keep that out of, you know, out of view from the, um, you know, the, the main road um, network uh, south of, of this building. So we will utilize the existing um, apron um, that is, that is Olander and Ford right now, Ford Crossing. 
We'll extend it. This is going to be a private road, but it's designed very much in the same fashion as the rest of the subdivision road up there. It's, um, it's proposed to have on-street parking, granite curbs, concrete sidewalks on both sides. Um, it is narrower in width um, in some key places. We narrow down to 22 feet or uh, 20 feet, I think, at this uh, raised crosswalk intersection here. There's another uh, narrowing of the roadway here to, um, to again, to, to slow down traffic um, and vehicles going to the north. This parking lot to the north of the building is a 35 car parking lot in addition to the parallel spaces, which will really be available to the general public, I think, um, or at least that's the intention. Um, overall, there's about 62 spaces that we're providing, including handicapped spaces. Um, and um, I can speak to a little bit more in detail, but given the um, uh, vehicle um, ownership, is that the right term? Uh, of, of the, the residents at other projects up there, it's about a 70% ratio, so 70% of the, the um, residents have a vehicle, which works out to about a parking ratio of 1 to 1.6. One, one one so in terms of the need and, and um, you know, requirement for parking to satisfy this, this project, we've got, you know, a, a, an abundance of, um, we've got an ample amount of parking. Um, this driveway intersection here, um, we are, Berkshire is also working on the co-housing project. Um, there are a number of comments in the DPW letter um, and may come up later in the conversation, but just so everybody's aware that we are designing these two projects in coordination. Um, we have coordinated slopes and drainage um, where connections will be, stubs for either project. So there's, those two projects have been fully coordinated there's understandably going to be some coordination stuff between timing and who does what when and you know i think that's part of the agreement is between mass development and tcb or um sunwood builders who's going to be doing the co-housing project just a question i'm sure. not sure to who but um the co-housing project has changed right the I developer will they need to come i know that we had already addressed it once but will they need yeah. to come back as like starting from scratch or how will that yeah, I mean, the, I think uh, I haven't seen any plans recently, but my assumption is there'll be significant enough changes that it'll come, it'll have to come back to you sort of to look at with fresh eyes, particularly as it relates to this new, completely different part of the project. Okay, all right. So they haven't, they're not ready yet at that point. Um, so again, the entry drive, uh, sidewalks on both sides. As you come around the parking lot, the notion is while it's not necessarily going to be strictly one way, um, you know the natural ability, the natural tendencies will be for this to function as a as a one way you know parking lot, though it's wide enough to function as two way. Um, a nice drop off and entry space out in the where the main entry of the building is, which is on the north side. Um, this area includes um, some tree grates, some additional shade trees there. Um, we've got a bike shelter similar to what um, TCB has done on some other projects, but it would be a you know a covered bike shelter that would hold. I think we've got seven or nine bikes. Um, trash uh, trash enclosure on this side as well. Um, we've really tried to tuck a lot of those sort of utilitarian pieces to the north side of the building, um, thereby preserving as much of this green space as as we could. Um, you know, our, our goal for this is really to provide some big central, you know, open green space that can function as, you know, as a lawn space, as a play space for all of the residents at Village Hill, not just this project. Um, but we're also, again, as I referred to before, um, reshaping one of the existing mounds to create, you know, this, this play feature of, um, there's a couple of playgrounds up there now um, on some of the various projects. Most of them are for the younger age kids, um, and they're pretty small. Um, so the hope with this one is to really make a more diverse, um, you know, playground that's um, that's useful by a wide range of, of age groups. So you know, running the, w the full range, um, and so you know, this this colored portion is a is a poured in place uh, rubberized surfacing going up the mound. Um, the idea is to include a roller slide, some other you know really different elements <coughs> that aren't up there already that might be an attraction and appealing to you know a lot of the residents and, and families up there. Um, and with that, you know, proposing a, a shelter, again, a, a covered sort of picnic shelter that would match the style of the um, bike, uh, bike shelter. But again, just a place to, 
you know, um, congregate to have picnics, but it could also function as a, you know, an outdoor, you know, music space where somebody could play a guitar. You know, there's there's an opportunity there, and the mound to to create a real <coughs> space that um, would benefit the community that that isn't up there already. Um, trail connections. I'll talk about this a little bit more in detail with some other slides, but we are proposing a, a connection from Ford Crossing. There's a large uh, specimen oak tree that's been uh, preserved on this uh, down the southwest corner. So we'll have a trail that you know winds up through behind the Pecoy development, the homes, um, out into this green space to connect the playground and the and the pavilion, um, and then wander down the hillside to connect up to the trail system um, that's on the west side of the site. Um, and again, well, I'll explain in more detail the other trail systems, um, you know, as, as, as an overall site um, description. On the south side, we've also got a small, uh, you know, patio area, sort of in that elbow of the building. Um, again, uh, barbecues, there's a small seat wall, um, you know, a place for both the residents, but also for, um, to create an opportunity for other events um, that could spill out on the lawn and, and other things. So. Um, Again, these are just sort of some details of that of that playground and how we envision it. This this mound, you know, really sort of wraps up and around, um, and so we're we're taking up a you know significant portion of it with this playground, and um, again, just to add some other um, element in that green space that that has some interest um, rather than just a flat uh, flat lawn area. Uh, utilities, I'll just zip through these real quick because they're relatively straightforward compared to the previous one. Um, there are currently stubs at the end of uh, Olander right in this location that um, anticipated full build out, um, both for this project but also for the co-housing. So, um, you know, we've got uh, water mains that will come up for, for fire and domestic that will service the TCB project. We've also coordinated um, stub locations for what we anticipate will, will come down to feed the, the co-housing project. Um, similarly with sanitary, again, it's a gravity-fed line from the TCB project. We've provided a stub um, up, in the, up at this location here, which will um, provide an opportunity for, for um, sanitary discharge from the co-housing piece. Um, stormwater uh, is a little bit more complicated, although this is a lot simpler than the last iteration. Um, Again, this, backing up, the transformation project that we had previously had about twice as much impervious area as what we're showing now, if those of you are familiar with that. Um, that project, as it was designed, worked with the existing system that's in place now at Village Hill. So we've reduced the amount of impervious area by quite a bit. Um, that, combined with the fact that we are trying to employ as many LID and sustainable stormwater elements as we can. So we've got a series of, you know, rain gardens that are capturing, you know, all of this water from the parking lot will be collected by these rain gardens. We're collecting in this, there's a depression here, which will collect a lot of the roof water um, on the east, south, and, um, you know, portion of the west side. That will all get detained in this small area here. And just like the previous project and what has been anticipated from, you know, day one is that this large detention, this, you know, other detention basin, the, the larger one is a little bit further south, but this second de secondary detention basin was always planned to accept stormwater runoff from this site, or at least a portion of it. Um, what was originally um, anticipated in the, in the original master plan was a much larger detention basin on the west side where Pecoy's development is, and the, this, the drainage area for this specific site was sort of split in half. We've reduced the, uh, reduced the impervious cover and the flow, stormwater flow is coming off this site enough so that we don't need any d additional detention on the west side. We can just send everything to the existing basin as it stands. We've got one small modification to the outlet elevation, which was very similar to the <laughs> transformations project. Essentially, there's an outlet control structure with a concrete, you know, cutout weir. We just need to adjust that elevation by, you know, it's like an inch or inch and a half. It's it's really pretty insignificant just to make all the numbers work. But that's it's still the same um, proposal. And so we will have a, a central drain line that runs down and discharges into that basin. Um, and as I mentioned uh, previously about the co-housing, 
we are fully aware of where this drain line sits in that project, um, how it, you know, how it will, um, you know, interact with the other drainage structures that are part of that project. So to the extent that, um, you know, you have some um, comfort level moving forward with the next project, just all I can say is that, you know, we've got that one big file in front of us and we're certainly coordinating all the various connection points and elevations and inverts and have been having that discussion with the DPW, um, recognizing that the co-housing project hasn't formally submitted permits yet, but we're, um, you know, we were actually just authorized to um, the other day, so those plans will be um, coming for you shortly. But that's just to give you a sense of um, what those, um, the, the coordination that's, that's taking place. Uh, planting, so again, these specimen trees, these larger, um, these larger trees here are all part of that list of, you know, 35, um, you know, specimen trees. So we are preserving all of those to the, um, you know, to the fullest extent practical. We've got, you know, some trail work that needs to happen that's close to some of these trees. We did work with an arborist, um, uh, Dave Hawkins from, um, you know, a fairly reputable arborist in the area, um, with this plan and identified um, some protection measures that, you know, we should consider around some of these. Um, he did make some comment about um, the potential impact to some of these trees as a result of whatever construction is being proposed, whether it be a, a gravel trail or the digging of a foundation. He did make some distinction in that report about, you know, what he felt was, you know, was a, a comfortable level of protection. <clears throat> um, also, as part of this report, um, you know, one of the interesting things, and it's, it's going to be a much larger discussion with the co-housing, but is the tree replacement standard. So when this overall project was conceived of, that standard was not in place. Um, it wasn't in place for the transformations project and has now, you know, come into play. So this project, we, we do satisfy the tree replacement standards. Um, you know, just to run through the numbers real quick, there's 13 trees that would qualify as needing replacement. Um, they're 20 inches. In, in diameter or larger. Um, it's a collection of evergreens and um, um, hardwoods. It amounts to uh, about 379 inches of caliper. We need to replace 190 of it. Um, there's another five inches from the lot 20 that I discussed earlier. So our calculations uh, produced 195 inches, caliper inches of tree that need to be replaced. So our planting plan calls out all the trees um, and we're proposing uh, a total replacement of 224 inches. So I can go through the planting plan in more detail if you want, but that's, you know, we're satisfying the replacement requirements. Um, there's a number of trees that we discounted because in the Arborist report they did note that um, they're either dead or are, are very badly diseased, um, you know, missing major leaders. And so um, those numbers are were where we ended up. Um, you know, with the overall replacement piece. Um, photometrics, again, this is a little bit easier. Um, there's a number of street lights. I don't know how it does show up very well, but you can, so there's one, two, three, four, five, six street lights that we're proposing, similar to this, which will match the style of <coughs> street light that's up at Village Hill now with a caveat that the ones that are there now are older lighting standards. I think they've got a, a, a globe that, you know, drops below the, the shield. Um, these are full cut off their LED fixtures. It's the same model number, just updated to include an LED full cut off dark sky compliant um, fixture. Um, the light levels, just to give you an idea, you know, this outer edge here is 0.5 foot candles. So it's, it is similar in light levels to what's there. Um, it seems low, but it's enough to um, light the roadways. And so, you know, we don't, as, as a result, there is, there is no, you know, spill uh, beyond the site. Um, and Cliff, I don't know whether you want to get up and yeah. talk about the building a little bit more. And yep, I think I'll start maybe go to the very end. So yep. Three, there's, that's probably that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, hi. The, uh, where I wanted to start was to give a, a sense of the scale of, of that open space, and that's really where a lot of the excitement uh, started uh, with this development was the 
opportunity to create a, a kind of usable uh, large-scale open space that is unlike any other available space and having that uh, available for the use of, uh, for the entire uh, the entire uh, Village Hill development. Uh, but with that comes in, and th so the, the shape of the building, the idea of a, of a larger L-shaped building helped to define that, helped define that space and, and kind of create, once you imagine the uh, co-housing development on the other side, it starts to become a very well-defined, large, uh, usable green space. Uh, with that, uh, but with the uh, notion of uh, creating a large green space and a large building where there once the uh, previous master plan showed uh, that entire site being broken up into smaller individual development lots. So it was a big change of thinking that really gave a lot more people sort of prime space on the site to enjoy uh, that part of the site, which is a very high part of the entire site. But with that, uh, with the switch to uh, a large, a large building came uh, uh, responsibility to really break up the scale of the building so it really fit in with the uh, uh, kind of development. Uh, there are a number of large buildings on the site, but our goal was to make this a more residential scale and have some very familiar uh, forms. So we did a lot of work of d dividing up the building both horizontally and vertically, a lot of articulation in the building, a complex roof line. Uh, the entire third floor of the development is up, embedded up in the roof uh, with their windows being provided by, by dormers. Uh, we provided smaller scale footprint on the, the most visible end elevation on the south that you see to the left. I'm having trouble with this mouse, there we go in this area of the building. Uh, so the, uh, again, the, once we committed to a larger uh, double loaded corridor building so that we could get the density where it needed to be, then we spent most of our time really articulating the building, making it much more uh, of a scale that we think fits in with the rest of the development. Uh, as far as the, the unit breakdown, I'll just briefly tell you, it is, it's 53 apartments in that building with eight, eight studio units, 23 one-bedroom units, 18 two-bedrooms, and four three-bedroom apartments. Uh, four of those apartments are going to be accessible, uh, fully group two level, actually a little bit beyond typical group two. Uh, four of those, and I did fail to mention it, 35 Village were providing an accessible unit there. We're under 12 units, so as a typically a building, uh, 20 units, you need an accessible unit, but we're looking at the whole complex and actually really providing enhanced accessibility by quite a bit uh, percentage-wise. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, other features that are incorporated into this building, and, and I should mention that we did a lot of uh, design collaboration with mass development, uh, a number, of, quite a few uh, iterations and refinement of the design. Some of the more important features of the aesthetics of the building is that all the mechanical systems are embedded in, because we have a double load, you can't really tell very easily from this, but because it is a double loaded width building, we have space in the middle where we're creating a well where all of the mechanical equipment will go. So it will absolutely not be visible uh, from anywhere on the site. And in fact, that is the case at, at, uh, at 35 Village as well. We've done uh, studies there to make sure that none of our rooftop mechanical equipment is visible. Uh, one of the biggest uh, and interesting features of this building, and uh, Rachna mentioned it, I think, at the very beginning, is we are pursuing Passive House uh, certification, in fact, so going the full route to get it certified under the Passive House program. Uh, briefly, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty intense. It's mainly about some uh, really amazing building envelope designed uh, with continuous insulation all the way around, no thermal breaks, really extreme attention play, uh, uh, paid to uh, tightness, air tightness, uh, very high performance windows, uh, balanced heating systems uh, because once you seal a building that effectively, then you really have to be sure you're on top of ventilating the building and controlling humidity within the building. 
So the systems are very carefully uh, designed in coordination. And then as importantly is managing solar gain, uh, use, using the sun for all the beneficial reasons when you need it, both through PV panels, the, bu the building will have a very large uh, PV arrays, also not visible uh, from the street, but there will be PV arrays on both the north, south, and east, west wings of the building. Um, uh, but also uh, because we'll have very thick walls and uh, some use of, of Brie Soleil will be controlling solar gain when you don't want solar gain. So we'll minimize heating loads and cooling loads uh, to keep the building extremely efficient uh, during this operating period. Uh, the materials on the building, I didn't really mention what they are. They're all. Uh, <laughs> High quality, long lasting materials, dense, uh, cementitious, dense cementitious panels, clapboards. Uh, some of the cementitious panels are very wood looking. They're not actually wood, but they really do look a lot like wood. And we have other flat panels and then clapboards uh, patterns to break up, uh, to break up the elevations. Again, keeping the scale at a level that we think will be uh, suitable. Uh, one thing Jeff didn't mention, and I'll get go back to that site plan here, is that this stretch at the south side of the site it has uh, been designated for development, much of the, uh, the same pattern of development along across the street, basically smaller individual home lots. And are there five? Five. Five, five lots on that side of the site. Uh, so the, which was a, a consideration as well. Actually, a lot of the studies we did was the view of this building because it is a large building. So we looked at it from kind of everywhere, including from the street to the south, looking between the buildings. So there actually will be smaller scale development, built development in the foreground when you're on the, uh, traversing the east-west road in front to the south of the site. Uh, I think that's about all I had. Those are the basics of it. I, again, I think Jeff pointed this out already. It was really all about the park, which is another reason why we put the parking around on the back. We didn't want that to be a, a feature in any way. Um, and I'll just try to real quickly go through um, some of the trail networks and connections that are um, part of the overall project and how they relate to this. Um, so again, this this is the exists. This is the overall campus with these two projects superimposed on them. Um, what you see in yellow here are really the major trail systems. Um, I think that are intended to connect at Village Hill. There's a lot of ancillary uh, walks that go through some of the green spaces in between buildings and such. But um, insofar as that, there's a main trail or main uh, multi-use path up along uh, Village Hill Road that continues to the north to this existing trail system that um, you know, branches off to the east to Smith College and off to the um, you know, Mill River um, and conservation land on to the northeast or northwest. Um, and then additionally, there's this trail on the east side that right now has been improved up to about, um, I guess, you know, this point in here somewhere. Um, it, it sort of follows an old roadbed, which continues off into the site. You can see sort of portions of it through here. But um, this image depicts how we envision, I'll show you in another slide later, how this sort of um, weaves into the co-housing project. Um, but so as part of this project, um, there's a small connection. Um, so again, just looking at a blow up of the site and some of the existing trails and road networks um, currently. This site, um, we've got a small connection on the west side that we've got to make. There's, there's currently, you know, right in this location here, the, <clears throat> the road, road or trail sort of ascends this, this hill really steeply, then drops off again um, on the north to join up to this. So we're really just sort of shaving off that mound and, and making that connection um, a more level connection. Um, and then on the east side, this is um, sort of where the existing trail is now. What we're doing is very similar to what we had proposed, uh, a similar alignment to what we had proposed with the transformations project, but picking up where it leaves off, 
taking it through the field um, underneath these large beech trees that are currently existing. Um, and then this predominantly follows an old roadbed um, up until about this location. And then the grades are such that we can really just be at, at um, existing grade, existing contours, and blend into the, um, the existing trail systems on the north side. Um, so those, those are the, at least my, our understanding is those are the major trail connections that are required to be installed as part of the overall, you know, general permit for, for Village Hill. In addition to those, as I pointed out earlier, there's some secondary paths that will be open and available to the public to take you from Ford Crossing sort of into this green space and around, as Cliff pointed out, these, you know, what will eventually be single family homes. Um, through the playground and then back down the west side, down this slope to join up to that path so you can avoid going through, you know, Pecoy's development. Um, this is the location of the future memorial park, so there will be a connection from Olander down to that multi-use path. Um, and then there will be some other informal paths um, that extend from the north side of the parking lot down to that trail system as well. Um, <clears throat> and again, these, some of these images are from the previous transformations project, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to reiterate that um, its alignment is, is really the result of a lot of the discussions that we had with that project and how that works into this site and impacts to backyards and some of the constraints. So a lot of the, the, the southern portion of this really um, resembles what we had presented previously just because it's, it, it seemed to make the most sense on, on many levels. Um, the one change that we did introduce with this project is underneath these beech trees, I think previously we had, um, <clears throat> excuse me, called out a, a wood boardwalk that would sit essentially at grade just because of the costs and some of the, um, you know, concerns associated with that and, and the introduction of some newer materials that we have um, the opportunity to use. What we're proposing is a, is a permeable, uh, poured in place permeable paving. It's a little bit different than porous asphalt but it's more durable than what you would see in a, in a rubberized playground. It's, it's a, you know, a little bit harder material. It is porous. It's designed for multi-use multi -use trails like this. Um, it's installed over a gravel base, which we, for this 100-foot section below these trees, we anticipate will just be set on top of the existing grade. Um, there's going to be very little, if any, disturbance in that area. Um, and, um, and then lastly, I just wanted to present this because we are working on both projects, just to give you, um, you know, this was a schematic plan um, of a full build out, um, which had it previously included that <coughs> project in the co-housing. We've edited those out to drop this project and really just to give you the board and, and the public an idea of, you know, now that we're nearing the end and really sort of have a sense of, you know, what, what projects we're looking at. I just wanted to provide everybody with an opportunity to look at, you know, those projects in concert. And so, you know, just to highlight this trail system, um, again, we come up through these beech trees, and the idea is to come in right along this roadway, which is expected, anticipated to come down, um, down this slope and weave between the trees. We have a crossing at this drive, and then it picks up again to the north side, so it sort of weaves through the, the co-housing development without being, um, you know, really too obtrusive, which was one of the major concerns down there. Um, but that's a that's an eight-foot wide, you know, fully accessible uh, multi-use path that, um, you know, we're anticipating to build. Part of the discussion I recognize, and Carolyn, you can, I'm sure we'll speak to it more earlier, uh, later, is just the timing of, of and the responsibility of, of all of this. Um, I think the expectation now is that the co-housing project will come in for permitting and be ready to build before the community builders. Um, I, you know, our advisement has been that, you know, when the site work starts in whatever area that, you know, whoever's there first makes sense for them to do it, there's going to be an agreement between Mass Development and TCB and Sunwood Builders, um, you know, as part of this in the city. Um, but um, as, as the timeline gets better understood, um, I think, um, you know, the full intent is that all those, um, all those agreements. All those and, agreements. And, that's a little weird. <laughs> um, will be in place um, to satisfy the requirements of the trail connections. So with that, um, I will leave it to the board.
questions or comments from the board before we open to public? So this, be, this is going to be continued because it's no stormwater permit. Do we just go over right. those after we hear from the public? Right. In addition. Yeah. So the, or, the zoning ordinance provides no parking requirement? So that parking spot, the whole village, right? This parking. <laughs> yes, I mean this is this is all private drive, private on street parking. It's going to be available for the public, but it's really to satisfy the needs of this project. What's being provided in terms of numbers is more than adequate to satisfy the need or demand for this building. So we expect there will be some additional spaces that will be available to the public. Sorry, so that, that whole green is primarily for the smoke zone in there, the residents in there. The, the green space? Oh, yeah, and, and the park, right. It's for everybody. For everybody. It's for everybody. For the village. Yes, oh, yeah, oh, it's, not, right. it, it's not intended to be an exclusive space just for this building. No, it's, it's for the residents of Village Hill. All right, thanks. Does the wooden pavilion in the green space have an electrical connection? Um, I imagine we'll probably coordinate one with that, yes. Okay. Any comments from the public on this particular project? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Robert Jonas, and uh, my wife Margaret here. We moved in, into Village Hill on April 1st or so. And we love being there. It's a really friendly neighborhood, and uh, everybody's got some interesting projects going on that they make available to other residents. I, we've never had such a friendly neighborhood in our lives, and uh, so if this is our this is our end game house, and uh, we're at 109 Olander Drive. I I, w I wish I could point more clearly, but um, we're right at Ford Crossing and Olander, right there on the right. Most of the maps that we've been looking at from the developers and others don't include our house because it's so recent. We've been a little concerned that our space has not been taken into account. One thing you'll notice is that our, our driveway opens right out onto Ford Crossing Road. So what we look at, what we're seeing now is all this traffic that's coming into the new developments, the co-housing and the apartment building, is coming right at our driveway. Um, and um, Margaret's been more, a little more concerned about this than me, but um, it, uh, line of sight is difficult at that space. and, and so. Anybody who's coming to the apartments or the co-housing is coming right to that area. Um, it was one of the advantages of the previous uh, transformations project is there were two ways in to all this. When you just think about traffic, there was a, there was a road in from the left-hand side. And uh, Jeff and Beth have been very kind to us to talk about traffic flow and so on, and they've assured us that there won't be a lot of streams of traffic. We expect that there will be maybe in the mornings and the evenings when people are coming go, going from work and school and that sort of thing. But um, uh, on, on the south side of our house is going to be the memorial park that comes right up to our yard, basically. There's not much distance there. And on the back of our property, um, this trail that um, Jeff talked about um, is going a, just a few feet from our back property line. So we're feeling a little bit scrunched um, in, in this, uh, it's quite of a small lot, but um, um, I, I just, uh, I've already talked to uh, Beth and Jeff about our situation, so, um, and I feel assured a, a bit, but I wanted you all to know that we're, we're concerned about the traffic there, and um, the only, uh, <clears throat> I kind of wish that other drive had been kept in this design. Uh, Maybe we will need a traffic light there. I don't know what to, what, what to expect here. Uh, I mean, we need a traffic light so we can push a button so we can get out of our driveway at certain times of the day. Uh, uh, so it's a concern. Um, but I just want to emphasize that I love the development. I, we both, Margaret and I both love the idea of affordable housing in the area because there are a lot of upscale people around, including us, uh, I have to say. Um, I, uh, I've been on the Kestrel Land Trust board for five years. I was the chair, and so my, my line of sight looks for open space as much as possible, so I really value the fact that uh, the developers have taken that into account. Uh, uh, my, my private opinion was that I wish there wouldn't be any more development, <laughs> but I, to be 
honest about that. But, but I think it's a good project and a good design uh, overall. But please, please keep our view in, in mind in, because we, our house does not appear on the maps. <laughs> Thanks. it to be too much more, but I just wanted to add, because I was listening to all this, that the, that the ideas for the, the play space and the, oops, somebody stopped me, um, the, the play space and the green space and, and, uh, and, and the, the uh, pathway coming yeah. underneath the specimen tree from Ford Crossing were all ideas that the community had that they incorporated, you know, um, so that just was some of some of what we heard and, and what we've seen. And in terms of traffic, I, I'm not, I totally am appreciative of your situation, but we also live on Village Hill Road with the um, other, with the, the three buildings that are, or the four buildings? Yeah. Hillside. Uh, pardon? Hillside. Hillside. Hillside, right behind us. And there's no noticeable, really, traffic. People, because people are going to work at different times and coming home at different times, that so we, we were surprised with all those things right around us that, you know, so I, I offer that as reassurance possibly for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Discussion from the board or motion? Uh, well, we don't want to close public hearing, right? We'll keep that open. So we can, I, um, I just want to pull up the date. Uh, I think the uh, I think the stormwater concerns would probably be addressed um, in for two weeks from now. So, um, if that is okay with the applicant, we have we only have one other hearing on the twenty fifth. Um, should I or should we at least go through these? I mean, just the. Um, I think we should probably wait because some of those might be addressed, addressed in, okay. the, um, in the revisions. So okay. <clears throat> we'll pass all the comments it's from on. DPW and, and um, other staff comments so that they can address those and maybe reduce Got the total it. number okay. of stations. Um, <coughs> we do have a 7 o'clock hearing um, on the 25th, so um, probably I would recommend 7.30 um, or later. For the twenty fifth. Um, yes, it's it's a new, um, actually another affordable housing project um, on Locust Street. Oh, um, okay. Subsidized housing. Yeah. Do you think thirty minutes would be enough? Well, yeah. I think if you do it at thirty, if you if we That'd need to bump it, at yeah. least you wouldn't. There yeah. wouldn't be a gap yeah. okay. in case you know this one was. That one was really quick. Does that sound amenable to? Okay. Can I will entertain a motion to continue? Tess, would you like to make? Did you say on Locust Street? Twenty fifth at seven p.m. Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Do I have a second? Second. By Mark. All in favor? Yes. Right. All opposed? None. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you'll get all of these to yeah. okay. All right. uh, Jeff, should we keep the drawings that we had tonight? Or is there going to be a good one? Um, <laughs> my job. <laughs> I don't think there will be much that will change on the drawings. It's really more just a bookkeeping thing. John, because it's like barren origins, grapefruits. We don't have to do all. Accept the minutes. Uh, hmm. I beat you. Dan's oh, already. What? But we'll take you as a second. Yes. We already have a second. Wow. Oh um, this wow. One. <laughs> oh, okay. Kudos to you. Oh. First thing. Okay. So I, I've got a motion and a second on the minutes. All in favor? Yes. All in favor? <laughs> All right, should we do that? That was uh, Dan. <laughs> yeah. Come on, pick it up, you guys. <laughs> Wait, I want a rehearing. <laughs> uh, do you want to tell us what team? Well, folks, folks, we, we do have a meeting to finish, so thank you. <laughs>
Um, so why don't we do that next? Because that's the TNA. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so um, uh, a, a long time ago when state hospitals was first approved um, as part of the traffic um, mitigation requirements, there were multiple traffic mitigation um, uh, mechanisms that were put in place. One of them was um, to for the um, hospital um, owners association to be par participate in a regional um, traffic demand management association and, and pay money into that. And the permit actually stipulated that originally the way mass development set it up was um, that um, uh, that there was an annual contribution um, requirement for the North Campus, um, but that was when there was more commercial development um, originally assumed to be on that side. So um, the condition said that if the structure changed uh, in terms of how the association or how much head money dues the association would pay, that. The planning board had to sign off on the reconfiguration and redistribution of that um, payment. So mass development now, because of the change, because of the increase in the total number of units on the north side from the original approved plan went up by 100 units, the balance between residential and commercial is different. So um, they're proposing that the association um, dues be um, um, balanced more equally between the uh, residential and commercial. So um, they need to, the board needs to approve that. Um, so I don't know if Beth, you wanna speak to that at all or um, your specific plan or if you want yeah, me to just. I mean, the, 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 the <coughs> summarize it well. So in the South Association, there's a transportation management contribution of $5,000 that's required by our special permit. South Association is home commercial. They, they pay $2,500 of that. The North Association <coughs> is uh, more evenly split between residential and commercial, um, and therefore we'd like to apportion that $2,500 evenly among the residential and commercial. Um, and so the special permit conditions requires that if we amend the covenant in this way, that we come back and get your approval. So that's what we're here for. Yeah. So what they would do is if you approve that, you know, 50-50 shift, then they would um, uh, record an amendment, amended covenant. So. What's the money for? Um, it goes into, so this regional, so there was this, um, it's changed names originally, there was this um, regional, um, Route, it was called the Route 9 um, transportation. Well, actually, I'm going to get the name wrong, but um, basically, a coordination of the communities um, across between Northampton and Amherst about uh, how to address um, and reduce um, tr trip generation or, or and create um, a mechanism for um, um, providing transit or different um, means of transportation across the region. So um, the cities had paid, city, communities had paid into it, and so this was also as a village um, development that is part of their mitigation, they would pay into it like a little sub-community of Northampton to contribute to the cost of um, design, um, development of um, different transportation um, mechanisms across east-west valley. You mean like mass transit yeah. or? Yeah, or um, you know, um, like, uh, like um, um, how, it? the ma uh, mass rides um, mm -hmm. program and um, different ways to um, uh, provide a means for people of um, not just buses but carpooling and, um, and then other rideshare uh, programs. Structure. I'm Sarah Backrack. I live in the Village Hill, and uh, the uh, residents are, a good portion of the residents are very concerned about this change. 
We feel as residents, we already pay taxes. We pay car taxes. We pay uh, rather high taxes to the city, and that this would be a second a second tax. Commercial buildings are the ones who have more transportation needs and, and incentives to have uh, more rapid transit, bus lines, so on. And so it, it, we feel that this is a, a double tax and shouldn't be put on us. It's, it's really to incentivize commercial people to come into Village Hill. I understand that, but there's one more commercial lot to be uh, utilized there, so I think it could have been planned for better, and I don't think the residents and many of us don't think the residents um, should be paying for this. All right, members, we'll step back forward. We didn't know that this was being heard or, or many more people would have stayed and spoken up, I believe. Thank you. How, how was the wording in the, I mean, in theory, it makes sense since the, since the, the build out was different than what was anticipated. They're looking to have the fee structure mirror the build out. Yeah. If that makes sense. But what was the wording in that initial agreement? Did it? Um, um, the initial covenant. Um, I don't know if I have that in front of me. Do you know, Beth, what the original wording the in the original covenant was? The original wording was just to have commercial on both sides. And then what, what really happened historically is in 2008, the covenants, Declaration of Covenants was filed in April, and then the master plan changed in August, and the number of residential units went up by 100, and the number of commercial square footage went down by 200,000 square feet. Um, so we felt that a fair apportionment between the residential and the commercial on the north side was justified. And I, I would put it in context as well that um, the resident's contribution to the TNA contribution comes to $7.06 a year. So it's, it's not a big amount. Just, and mechanically, how, how does it happen? How does a resident actually pay the seven? There's a budget for each association. And so if there's a line item in the North Association budget for $2,500. And that is split among the fee assessment for all the residential and com commercial units on the North side. And so that's where, for the residential uh, units, it comes to $7.06 a year, their portion of that $2,500. And, and is it by unit, or is it like, is our yes, some units more? Yes, it's by number. Your assessment is based on uh, your unit. Okay. But, it, but it's not quite by unit, because the commercials are, are designated units in a different fashion than the rest of us. The commercial is based on square footage, and they have a higher ratio. So it, it, um, I think it's the principle of the thing more than anything else, because all the fees are rather small if you really spread them out, but the principal gets first. Okay. Thank you. Other comments, questions from the board? Can you just say again, so this contribution to the TMA was in lieu of, uh, this was part of the, the mitigation. Part so of it had to be mitigation for the total bill. There has to be mitigation somehow. It's just that it's taking right. this particular form. So right. So so yeah. it's not the the vote on the table isn't to get rid of right, the right, right. participation of the TMA. It's to yeah, yeah. restructure. Restructure it, right. I'm just saying side. backing up like yeah. there there is no scenario where residents wouldn't have to That's mitigate something. somehow. Right. 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 It seems like a fair distribution. I don't know why. Divide it up. That's how it is. Is this yeah. a recurring fee? So it's every year? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Hmm. Considering what we extort from people in traffic mitigation fees um, for approval of a building lot or a small development, which I think is really hard to justify, this seems like pennies. Um, I mean, if we extort thousand or two or five thousand dollars from people doing a single family house or a small development it's true it's only a one time and this is annual but you know it doesn't seem like much I, I agree with that but in those cases the applicant is paying that in this case it's being imposed on a homeowner that previously didn't have to 
paid for because it was a commercial. Initially, it was meant for a uh, commercial entity, and, and then it was, the build out was different. And that all makes sense to me, the way it's reconfigured, but, but it's coming on the back end to a homeowner who wasn't aware of it versus the applicant should pay that in lieu of. So Although that that's part of buying into, like, yeah, in a condo situation, you yeah. would review those bylaws extensively and know. But those didn't exist. Right. Then. And the homeowners also right. kind of benefited from the fact that there's more homes there and there's a lot of development going on and there's all these things that they right. do. How is that a benefit? Well, more, more houses, more people there, the property, the, I'm guessing the value has gone up on the, on the properties. Or it seems like a disadvantage to me. No, no I think people being around, I mean, if you want to yeah. live in a country, go live in a country. A Weeds residents. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to, to clarify, the residents are paying something now, but what they're paying is going to go up. No, we no, oh. not paying. No, that's what I'm saying. They're not paying. They're not paying any. I thought they were paying no, no, something that was changed. They are so. paying this yeah. now. We This was an oversight on our part that we didn't realize because in April, the uh, consolidated boost statement of the uh, um, covenants was filed, and then the master plan change came that August. They sort of got crossed in the night, and nobody picked up on this discrepancy um, until more recently when the until residents we were, were questioning it. Mm -hmm. So really, the TMA contribution is all about trip generation. And so the fact that you've got 100 more units with at least 100 more cars, that, that's trip generation. So the TMA membership is to mitigate that particular thing. So it's, it's clear to us that the residents contribute to trip generation and therefore should be part of that mitigation. That was the reasoning. But they were part of the original agreement. They, they had a contribution. And now we're just now you're looking to increase the contribution. No, it's not going to increase because we've been we've been doing this all along, and so it's only that when uh, the residents asked about it that we realized there was this discrepancy, and that's what we're here to repair. So they changed they changed the covenant, but it required planning board approval. We will have to formally amend the covenants. They didn't yes. change the covenants yet. Right. right. Yeah. So we'll, we'll require your approval to formally uh, amend the covenants. I guess I'm confused. Has there been a time when residents on the North Campus have not been paying into the TMA? No. Okay. So to me, so if they've always been paying in, now this is just a book. It's always been a contribution. Right. Right. Yeah. That's now it's, right. now right. it's right. we're yeah. shifting right. okay. yeah. or balancing, that makes me feel rebalancing. Right. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, anyone want to make a motion? But it might be, might be. We're just I mean, so is have is the rebalance proportional? Does it make sense? Has anybody looked at the the numbers? Some seven now. Um, I didn't look at the. I mean, conceptually, I think the rebalance makes sense. Such a um, nothing. I, you know, it's. Um, I didn't uh, divide it by the total. See, I mean, on the south side, there are only two commercial tenants, right? On the south side, it's completely commercial. Right. This is for the north. It's right, right, I know. But it's still bound. So it's split south and north. And so the there's 2,500. pay proportionally more per business than each residential unit. Yeah. It's a different formula that's used for the commercial unit. But the formula is based upon square footage and trip generation relative to the square footage. Right. Yeah. And so I guess what I'm so what I'm saying is, with the decrease in square footage for the commercial, does that equal the amount that we're shifting now to the residents? It is increasing. Although I mean that's really the only way to evaluate this, and to be fair about it, and not just it's shift. Not nowhere else in North well, that's because well, that's, of the nature yeah. of the development. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. this was built its own. We're, we're trying to get ready to live by the <coughs> documents that mass development wrote. And as we review them, we're seeing more and more where it's, oh, that was an oversight and we'll make it correct. So we're just concerned about, you know, we did read the documents and 
we brought it up and then then it becomes a fait accompli because they were arbitrary about it and didn't follow the documents that were written. And so the North Association is not governed by a separate board or like, is there a board of trustees for that North Association? A board member who is Max Kellner. Okay. So while the, the village hill is being built out, that's the structure that uh, Richard I Henderson, see. who's head of real estate, okay. is the board member for both the North and the South Association. Okay, that's interesting. And then what happens upon build out? Then you Head transfer to a resident, um, uh, okay. resident and commercial unit elected board. So yeah. is there a scenario where um, in the future an elected board could come back to the planning board because they have voted to, to change that apportionment? It requires 80% of all the folks living there, of which the commercial units have a greater leverage on the vote. There's more residential units that the Right, square footage wise, yeah. And it requires ninety percent. So we're we're again. I think if the principle is the issue, if the documents were written, it was the original design, and maybe it was an oversight. But if that's a fair way to to do whatever, I'm not sure that it's an oversight. I mean, I, may, I might be I might be misunderstanding this. It seems like things have changed. The the original structure was based on a prior plan, which has now changed and we're trying to adjust the fee to reflect actual conditions. Is that, am I reading that right? Well, I, I think it's, it's correct, but not even trying to adjust the, the fee, just trying to adjust the covenant to mirror the fee that's based on the, the build out that was different than originally planned. Right, but the intent is yeah. to adjust, to balance <coughs> to actually reflect reality, which was the original intention of the covenant to begin right. with. Except so, that when we purchased the house, Places, we read the condo docs, but you didn't get an annual budget. So we couldn't discern, again, it's small, but we couldn't discern where the contradictions are. And so I, you start I, to I get, get that, and I agree with that, but if, if I would feel differently if the fee was being imposed now. If we change the language and suddenly there's a $7 a year fee, if, if everybody who's been, who's been buying property up there with the homeowners association was paying the $7 a year, and now we're just changing the wording to, to mirror what they've already been doing, then I, I think it's just a bookkeeping thing. That's what we're doing? <laughs> yeah. That does, I don't, I don't think so. Correct, Beth, so. Yes, yeah. that, that is so true. So they've been paying. They've been paying. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, in addition, yeah. just yeah. to be clear, I mean, this has been said a number of times, but we're talking about $7 per year. Not per day or per month. That perhaps, perhaps per all, could only be justified to be at four dollars per year. I mean, I don't know. That's hot. just well, that's throwing that out. Or but it's. Years. I understand the principle. I mean, I suspect you're probably right. But it's. So what are you paying now? Totally insignificant, well, we meaningless they amount just, of money. It's just that the uh, the fees have gone up thirty percent in the five years, and I don't know because I wasn't here five years ago if people have always paid this. So the fees are minor. They're, they went up $20 is, a month. Is the fee structure based on a full build-out of the North Campus, or is it based on what exists now, and it keeps adjusting? So the fee structure, we made a conservative estimate of the full build-out of residential. So actually, if everything gets built from TCB and the co-housing, the residents um, and the commercial, their fees will go down because there will be more units than we conservatively estimated would be there. But there has been more residential than commercial build up. Yes. Right. yes. So I but think it's fair enough to equalize the number because the residents, they have car fee, right? So it has to do with this. Let, let me just make one more and then I'll be quiet. Is okay. it Within the association, which is the entire north side, there's condo associations and they have condo fees. There's home owners association, they have homeowner fees. Um, so maybe it's more fair to the single families that only pay taxes to, to the city. 
But so this fee may be very small, but it starts to add on and add on for all the other things. I think that's a function of the village building. That's yes, no, like that's, that's a separate. This is a yeah, like, in fact, this is a I, I know you're here because you have to be here. Because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, why would you be here? Um, but but and I and I don't know how this was really originally written, but I mean, this seems to be an association kind of mm -hmm. discussion. I, I'm not sure why this particular thing would have to come. I know it's it does because it's in the covenant, but I I, I don't. It doesn't seem like this is really the place to resolve it. It seems like it's more of an issue amongst the residents and the association and all that. I understand that we have to make some decision about it, but I, I don't know whether, if you ever do this again, <laughs> <it's> <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> stay <laughs> hospital again, you might do a little different. Yeah. Residents have no power because we're not an association. Yeah, it, that, that's, it that's seems that's like, that's the right. Yeah, that's but, the, yeah. But it's, it's, you it's, will uh, eventually. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I think what, well, build that, then the whole dynamic's gonna change at build out. I mean, that's gonna be, that's yeah. Okay. So the way that they're proposing the language, to the state, the stated proposed language in the covenant would be the portion of the TMA contribution required to be paid under the special permit decision dated January 26, 2002 as amended and the subdivision approval dated January 2004 as amended for Village Hill North may be proportionally allocated to residential and commercial unit owners of the North Campus and Hospital Hill Development is authorized to amend Article 4 of the Consolidated Restatement and Amendment of Declaration of Covenants, Restrictions, Maintenance, Easement, and Agreements, dated 08, as amended to provide for such proportional allocation between the residential and commercial unit owners. Yeah. Thanks Thank for you. listening. Thank you for staying. Thank you for staying. Okay. So You've got a A. It's a legal. Uh, legal I've got an A and R, and then right up there where they can store. Okay, so this is on Squatter Street. That's an issue. I, I just was not. I agree. Condo um, owner, like I would be pissed if suddenly yep. um, I was like, well, what is this? So it's on the end of Squatter Street, Thank close you. to Stop and Shop. It's got 130 feet of frontage, so it's a single, it's a two family. They want to cut it off, but we need to share a separate single family house lot. Move approval. Move approval. Alan's second. All in favor? Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. okay, I just have <laughs> one bar. Oh, 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 sure. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Is this another one that wasn't on there? It was just one that, uh, yeah. Um, so this is a reduction, a request, and a reduction of letter of credit for the Pequoy. So it's all about the state hospital. Yeah. Um, so they want to drop down um, from uh, about 500 and change to 308,728. It's gone through DPW. Um, so they're asking almost $200,000 reduction from the last reduction back in June. Of and DPW says okay. DPW is fine with the numbers that they submitted, and they've been giving weekly or monthly reports on construction. Motion to approve. Absolutely. Second, Mark. All in favor? Okay, that's all. <laughs> Dan, motion to adjourn. <laughs> 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 <laughs>